If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. A reference to the Georgica Curiosa from 1687 indicates that ground and dried hops are, quote, given to secondary fermentation. That is, when added to unfiltered beer in packages, refermentation occurs, producing alcohol and, of course, CO2. Wait, stop. CO2? Does that mean I can carbonate beer with hops? Well, that is exactly the question asked by our guest today in the lab, Dr. Luke Chadwick, a senior scientist at Bell's Brewery. Now, if you haven't listened to episode nine of the podcast where I discuss the freshening power of hops with Jake Kirkendall, go listen to it. Seriously, I'll wait. So Jake was working under the supervision of Dr. Luke Chagwit for his experiment where he was able to show that secondary fermentation caused by dry hops resulted in a near 1% increase in alcohol by volume. But the products of fermentation are alcohol and CO2. So if we're starting from the premise that hop creep isn't a bad thing, it's just another tool we have as brewers to control the outcome of our beer, it seems like a very natural extension to see how much CO2 is is produced and find out whether we can carbonate beers with dry hops. I mean, think about the applications, right? Hops have antimicrobial properties. The secondary fermentation scavenges destabilizing oxygen. Volatile aroma compounds are trapped uh, in the package and not released during transfer or forced car- carbonation. So, Uh, Dr. Chadwick had these same thoughts and decided to do a quick and dirty study to see whether and to what extent we might be able to use dry hops to carbonate beer. Now, the results may not be life-changing, but he and I were able to discuss uh, the freshening power of hops or hop creep in more detail, including how it might be inhibited or controlled and how we might be able to put it to use. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And if Apple is your provider of choice, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps people find us who might be interested in brewing-related shows, and it helps us make sure that we're bringing you the best content. If you're looking for another way to support us and you would like to be rewarded for your support, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Depending on your contribution level, you'll receive rewards for your support like access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. Last month was Jason Petros of Voice of the Brewing Network, but this month is Sean O'Sullivan, or Sully, who is a co-host of uh, the Brewing Network's The Session and co Coincidentally, co-founder and brewmaster for the 21st Amendment Brewery in San Leandro, California. To become a patron and get access to these sweet rewards, head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You can also support us by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support, which give us a small kickback when you make online purchases through our partner vendor websites. Just start your shopping experience by using the links listed at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback is brought to you by the innovative team at Haas, who recently announced Lupamax, a hop product with a consistent concentration of lupulin for optimized hop flavor that allows brewers to use upwards of 30% less hops to achieve similar results as T90 pellets, thus increasing yield without compromising beer quality. Available in varieties including Citra, Mosaic, and Amarillo, all of us here at Brewlosophy love Lupamax, and the reviews from others are equally as positive. You can learn more about Lupamax and all of the other amazing stuff Haas has to offer at johnihaas.com. That's John, the letter I, H-A-A-S.com. 
All right, listener Paul from Houston, Texas wrote in. He said, Cade, hey, you're doing awesome. I'm jealous that you're living the dream and living, studying beer. Thanks, Paul. Me too. Uh, I really like the episode on tubing. It was really easy to follow and had astounding findings. On the downside, I'm having trouble keeping on track with many of the other episodes. It seems like there's a lot of discussion and the results are packed at the end. Problem is, by then, I can't make the leap and bring it all together because it may take a session or three to get through the whole thing. Maybe it's because I'm casually listening while exercising or driving when my thoughts frequently wander. Perhaps it would be easier for me to get meaning to break it into short segments of background on the researcher, then mention the findings up front, and showing how the background and experimental design support it. I know the original podcast with Marshall saves uh, findings for the end, but with such a detailed technical podcast like yours, there are so many details that the point gets lost by the time the findings are revealed, at least for me. I think keeping the results refreshed makes the discussion on the rest, backgrounds, methods, and all the other info relevant throughout the podcast. Anyway, keep up the good work and I admire your passion and work ethic. Paul, thanks for the feedback. Uh, I received a few emails like this, uh, which I really appreciate. And so I started doing a couple of things which you should start to see in the next few episodes. So one of those is discussing the experiment and the results for a minute or two right after the researcher background portion, kind of just like you suggested. So hopefully that kind of frames, um, you know, frames the topic and where we're going for you. I kind of think of it like reading the abstract of the paper right before diving diving in uh, uh, to the discussion, or at least uh, that's the idea. And the second thing I've started doing, um, especially since the the tubing episode, is started spending a little bit more time defining terms up front with the guest, sort of before digging into the hard science. So I hope those two things will help. I'm also kicking around some other ideas in my head and always looking to improve. So thanks again for listening and for the feedback. And any other listeners, if you've got suggestions, please send me an email, cade at brewlosophy.com. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Dr. Luke Chadwick about his research into carbonating beer with dry hops. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. Some things aren't obvious until someone says them out loud, and that's exactly what our guest did today. When discussing the freshening power of hops, which most people call hop creep, he noticed the additional alcohol, reduced sugars, and increased CO2 production, and asked, wait a minute, if there's additional CO2, doesn't that mean we could carbonate a beer with dry hops? So Dr. Luke Chadwick, a senior scientist at Bell's Brewery, is here with us today to discuss an experiment he performed to see whether and to what extent we might be able to use dry hops to carbonate beer in the final package. So Luke, welcome to the Brew Lab. Thank you so much for having me, Cade. I'm excited for you to be here. I was talking with uh, Jake Kirkendall after his show uh, where we talked about that was where we sort of first introduced this idea of the freshening power of hops. Um, And, you know, his experiment, uh, I know you were involved with uh, at Bell's. um, And uh, he said, hey, if you think freshening power of hops is interesting, you really need to talk to the guy. Um, And the guy he was referring to was you, Dr. Luke Chadwick. So (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty excited to have you on the show. Well, I am humbled. Thank you. Uh, so you are a senior scientist at Bell's. Um, how did you get involved studying, uh, you know, brewing science? Well, I kind of sort of a, a roundabout um, path. I, I study natural products chemistry. That's that's what I um, um, was interested in from from college. I was loved organic chemistry and um, got turned on through my organic chemistry professor in undergrad to um, just the, the field of natural products, chemistry, and just sort of opened my eyes to this world of really cool puzzles to solve, all these molecules out there in nature that do things of potential value, you know, for society and humans and health and pharmaceuticals and, and all that. And then I learned about um, this program in Chicago, um, University of Illinois at, at Chicago, uh, Department of Pharmacognosy. Pharma what? 
anyway, long story short, um, at the time when I went into grad school, and still, I think there's there's not too terribly many options if you're interested in studying natural products. There's just not too many programs that you know focus on that. Chicago is one of the, and still is definitely one of the top um, <clears throat> institutions for you know, studying bioactive natural products. Anyway, my goal at the time was to um, you know discover the cure for cancer, save the rainforest, and so on. Um, <laughs> and instead you uh you started looking at beer <laughs> well yeah so, so the program that i was in um soon after i started won a grant from the national institutes of health and became a, a center for botanical dietary supplements research so basically an nih national institutes of health center for dietary bot- botanicals research and the sort of the hook for that grant was um to focus on uh, botanicals for women's health and interestingly, one of the 10 plants that were selected and, and sort of, you know, proposed as this you know, very comprehensive research program was hops. And I was given the um, option to be like the guy that you know, works on the hops for, for, that, um, for that research project. And by that time, I had already kind of realized that a lot of people in this program spend years becoming like the world's expert in some obscure plant and they know all the chemistry of that plant and they bioactivity and they're sort of the world's experts in you know in that plant um but it's kind of hard you know for you know career wise to capitalize on that anyway the point being when i was offered the opportunity to work on on hops and study the you know the, the, the chemistry of hops I absolutely jumped at that that chance because I knew hops are interesting for lots of reasons, and that there's you know um, you know if this whole uh, natural products drug discovery career thing um, doesn't go the way I planned, then then I can fall back and, and and there's other reasons to know about hops other than discovering drugs. I love it. I love it, and I I'm guessing you've never looked back. Um, studied hops for your entire career, then yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So you're at uh, so you're at Bell's. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do at Bell's. So as you mentioned, my 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 title is senior scientist. I work in the quality lab department. Uh, um, my boss, quality manager Derek Stepansky, um, sort of keeps us um, organized and, and, and on track. Anyway, so I, I get to work with. Um, so under Derek, we have basically all the analytical chemistry, microbiology, and sensory essentially all the sort of endpoints of, of beer and brewing, all the analysis. Um, and um, so I awesomely get to dabble in all of those things and work on projects with them um, um, related to sensory, related to micro, related to analytical, you know, a lot of method development work. Um, over these years, I've been doing a lot of GCMS work, looking at beer aroma, hop aroma, hoppy beer aroma. <laughs> Those three things are all very different things, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, absolutely. Very, uh, that's awesome. So, so you're kind of able through your role to look at all different aspects of brewing science. That's really fun. That's a that's uh, a really cool opportunity. And I guess one of the things that you ultimately got interested in was this concept. Uh, about the freshening power of hops, and I love I love calling it that, right? I think most people, um, you know, uh, uh, would refer to it colloquially as hop creep, um, but I, I think I'm like you. The, the hop creep just sounds creepy. <laughs> and it, it really, it just inherently just it indicates that it's something that's out of control, that is not understood, that is creeping up on you, that you don't see it coming, right? Um, whereas, you know, come on. Yeah, the epiphany for me was randomly stumbling across the this Brown and Morris work from from 1893, doing a Google book search. You know, Google, as you know, is categorizing the world's knowledge, and they're doing, I think, a amazing job. Anyway, full text search. uh, This was actually right after um, somehow I got onto a a conference call with um, Dr. Shellhammer and. Um, some other folks from another brewery, this was like 2017, 2018, so, something like that. And in that meeting is when I learned the phrase hop diastase. Shellhammer or someone, someone in, that, in that, um, that meeting turned me on to this paper from 1941 
Uh-huh. Um, the Janicki article, hop diastase. That's an interesting phrase. That's a unique term. I'm going to Google that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> And I did. And then it, it, that's when I just stumbled across that, that Brown and Morris work. And it was like a, just like a, I don't even know how to describe how like, like up until that moment, <laughs> this was, as far as I knew, kind of like an unknown thing. No one has any idea. No one's ever studied it scientifically. This is totally unknown. Yeah. And then to read this paper from 1893, where it's clear, this was very well known. This was one of the Clearly, one of the primary reasons that people dry hopped beer yeah. was this property. There was obviously you know, aroma and everything we know about now is was was there. The hop varieties were certainly different back then. <clears throat> um, but anyway, the, the, the secondary fermentation, what we what is referred to as hop creep now, was was one of the reasons that one of the primary reasons hops were were added to beer. Yeah, I and I love that. You know, the the tip of the research iceberg these days is let me Google it <laughs> and see what I can find. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just I I love that. And of course, you know, hop diastase. That's a cool way you know to think about this too, because we we talk about a lot in malts. Um, you know, diastatic power. Right. That's the same thing. It's the ability mm-hmm. of the malt to convert complex starches into sugars. And now we're talking about hop diastase. And wait, hops are able to do this. Um, so yeah, that's very cool. And if you want more information about the Brown and Morris uh, paper, I'd encourage you to uh, go and find that uh, book uh, rather, um, and then uh, check out the episode with Jake Kirkendall. We went kind of behind the scenes into the science, or uh, you know, f- the the historical science. We'll say uh, not the more recent stuff that that Shellhammer and others like yourself and uh, Jake Kirkendall uh, have done into the freshening power of hops. But that's a good a good research or a, a good place to start there. So, all right, well, let's talk then. We 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 sort of defined the term freshening power of hops in that episode with uh, with Jake. Uh, but I wanted to sort of ask. you you, you know, kind of fundamentally, uh, or, or a more fundamental question, I guess, is, you know, there's this concept of dry hopping, and why we, why do we call it dry hopping? And how does that relate to the freshening power of hops? Yeah, I, so, th- you know, through, through all of, um, you know, this research, and, and re- I think yeah, even reading be- between the, some of the lines in the Brown and Morris articles, um, and just, you um, so knowing that drying a dry beer from you know the British terminology means the you know decrease in specific gravity. There's there's less dextrins. There's less body. It's that's sort of the definition of what a, a dry dry beer is. And I remember, before that, I was curious about that term dry hopping. Why do they call it that? Like, what is the the opposite? Then would be wet hopping, right? Right. Um, but that wet hopping isn't really a thing. Obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's done, but it's not, that's not what, clearly that's not what um, was the, what it was intended to denote or, or, or designate. Um, anyway, just like, duh, you add hops and it dries out the beer. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that just seems like, um, you know, until I see other proof or something like that, that's the simple explanation for, for that. Um, Right for the, for that term, and that's that's cool, right? Because that's what we're talking about. The freshening power of hops is actually drying out the beer. So the term dry hopping may include a historical context of what we are talking about is this new thing, right? That we're so suddenly discovering in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. You know, um, but yeah. So and and we know we've been dry hopping uh, barrels for hundreds of years, right? I've never seen any pictures, but I've seen lots of heard, heard stories and seen paintings. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. And the story of the IPA, the India Pale Ale, that's the, the story that, that, that I know. I've never really seen too, you know, like detail, ever seen a, like a detailed account of the process of loading barrels onto a boat and adding hops and when they add the hops and how much I, it's out there. I'm sure. Sure. You know, yeah. Google, keep going, Google, because I'm sure there's, you know, full text out there that describes in great detail, you know, how much hops to add and whether it's winter or summer, you know, stuff like that um, is going to be, um, is out there is, you know, sort of lost knowledge that's just waiting to be 
um, you know, re- refound. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and one of the, actually speaking of lost knowledge, I didn't know this until you and I were sort of chatting about uh, about this. Uh, you told me that there, uh, you know, dry hopping was prohibited for a period of time in, uh, in Germany. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so the the Ryan Heights kibbutz. When I started in um, 2010 in the in the brewing industry. It was either right around then, it was right around then when apparently like a 500 year old law in Germany was finally overturned. Apparently the, the Reinheitsgebot or the sort of the, the, the purity laws of the early um, uh, 16th century, early 1500s ish. Um, mm-hmm. This was, as far as I understand, the, in, in the world, sort of the first really comprehensive effort to define things, to define commodities. And one of the um, aspects was that beer was defined as something that can only contain water, hops, barley malt, um, in, right. in particular, and among many other things. And apparently, so, so somewhere in there, also it was specified that um, that hops can only be added, like in the kettle or something. That they can't be added after fermentation. I've again never seen the original text, but that was the understanding. Anyway, this has been overturned in Germany, I guess, relatively recently. Um, and you are now allowed to, um, to dry hop. But, but what I think is really fascinating that I, I, I hope to dig into more this, there's a paper again, like I said, I'm doing a lot of GCMS type work and there's a paper from, um, 2016 from, um, Dr. Becker's lab in, in, um, at Weinstefan, I'm sorry. Yeah. At Weinstefan, you know, top notch, um, institution of course anyway this is a paper about um this new hop variety from uh, mandarina bavaria this is in um inst- the journal of uh, ibd institute of uh, brewing and distilling but the title is influence of hop harvest date of the mandarina bavaria hop variety on the sensory evaluation of dry hopped top fermented beer really most of the article is about you know, gcms analysis um, sensory analysis and so on but in the introduction there's just this really really interesting this this sentence that that caught my eye it's in the it's the first sentence of the second paragraph this is the dry hopping technique has already been used for many centuries mainly to improve the microbiological stability of beer i'm sorry two sentences next sentence therefore kiln dried and ground hop cones were given to secondary fermentation <laughs> wow. and then there's a reference reference 8 um, which is um, the the Georgica Curiosa from 1687, and um, basically, I don't know. I, I've actually just in preparation for this this show a little bit. I tried, you know, once again to like dig in and, and find. I actually did find a uh, um, a, a, a translatable um, version of the Georgica Curiosa, um, and there's a bunch of really interesting stuff in there. But I still haven't found anything that explains basically what. You know, the way I read this sentence is what it's saying is, is, is basically dry hopping has been around for a very long time, but they stopped doing it because of hop creep. Secondary fermentation. <laughs> That's yeah. the way I read this. And then they cite a paper from, or a, sorry, a, a book. I said, like, a, this was like an encyclopedia or like a, yeah, a yeah. codex, like a sort of um, a just massive dump of information. Really, you know, extensive sort of body of knowledge and yeah. advice, basically yeah. advice for people, Germans, um, from the 17th century. A- anyway, so in there, in there somewhere, I bet are going to be some details about hop creep and maybe some scary stories about exploding barrels and <laughs> overpressurized vessels, whatever s- stuff like that. And in 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 the the clear reason why hops were banned from, you know from the sort of brewing practice for or dry hopping, I'm sorry, was banned from the you know, standard practice in, in Germany centuries ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's amazing. So, so we've got a, a reference, at least in this, you know, 2016 paper, a reference to the Georgica Curiosa from, you know, the late 17th century that deals with secondary fermentation. So clearly, like you said, this was a thing uh, that's been around for hundreds of years, and we've been talking about it as like hop creep, as if it's this thing that we don't know, uh, you know, that's going to, like you said, creep up on you or, uh, you know, mess up your beautiful brew. But, you know, 
isn't it something we should be sort of considering from the front end? Like if we know that, you know, we know adding dry hops is going to do some things to the beer because we can see it, right? We can see um, like in Jake Kirkendall's um, um, experiments, almost a 1% change in ABV uh, just by dry hopping, uh, which, so I think that's fascinating it and, and sort of to get to your, uh, to your experiment where we look at, okay, well, we know that there's secondary fermentation happening, happening there. A byproduct of sec- secondary fermentation is, uh, you know, CO2 production. You know, well, how can we how can we maybe harness that and see if we can do some CO2 production? So let's um, let's just sort of briefly talk about some of the biochemistry. Like, what do we know about the mechanism of FPH or freshening power of hops? So okay, it, we we know it's very complicated. I think, and we know that. Most of what there is to know as far as chemistry, you know, biochemical mechanisms is, you know, yet to be you know, explored thoroughly in the context of hops. In the plant kingdom, however, there's a extremely, you know, you could spend the rest of your life, Cade, you know, reading about amylase, amylases in the plant kingdom. And specifically, I think a key concept that we want to bring out here today in this discussion is amylase inhibitors. Or just the, the the concept of enzyme inhibition in general is uh, uh, fascinating. You know, it's 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 hard to um, I can't possibly do it justice to explain just like the, the diversity and the you know just all the different strategies that plants have come up with to to um, you know, survive in nature. Right? They can't run away. Um, they don't really have sharp teeth for, for for the most part, and so they're you know their defense is chemical. So protease inhibitors, amylase inhibitors. Basically, that's the sort of two major, um, two of the major sort of themes. And basically what it means, what the effect is, if an animal eats a plant that has, is loaded with, say, you know, protease inhibitors, then that animal is not going to get their protein. They're not going to get their nutrition, mm-hmm. you know, all the, you know, proteins that they've eaten or, or whatever. And, and you know, that day, those days will not be broken down. They will not get the nutrition and they will learn when I eat that plant I get sick. <laughs> uh, right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, and, oh, oh my God. Okay. Another tangent. So <laughs> again, in preparing for, for this show, I just was trying to, you know, sort of trying to put together, um, just in my own mind, a, a, a general understanding of, you know, what is known about amylases and amylase inhibitors in, in the sort of in the, in the plant kingdom through that, I stumbled across, uh, what is it? Amylase, um, trypsin inhibitors okay ATIs are you familiar with this no no not at all I, I wasn't either until until yesterday um, but it, within you know five within the last five years or so it's, it seems like a very hot topic um, so there's compounds from grains wheat barley these are proteins apparently anyway so these amylase trypsin inhibitors are um, entities I think they're proteins or peptides that have the ability to um, to inhibit both proteases and amylases. Okay, so so these things, so the amylase, the trypsin um, inhibitors, the, so that would stop conversion, right? That would stop the ability of uh, you know the the conversion of those long chain sugars into the fermentable sugars that the yeast could consume, right? Correct. Um, but I'm I'm bringing this up more to. I guess where I should have started with, you know, so I was trying to get to just the basic, the basic concept of enzyme inhibitors and just how unbelievably widespread they are in nature uh-huh. and what a sort of common sort of theme that is for, for plants to, to produce enzyme inhibitors to either for their own metabolism or to prevent predators or, or, or so on. Generally how enzyme inhibitors work are um, um, there's, there's um, sort of permanent inhibition where so a, a sort of a permanent inhibitor or so-called suicide inhibitor will bind like covalently bind to the active site on the enzyme. So, so backing up one, one step, the amylase enzyme, what it does is it takes a substrate, a starch, and that starch will migrate and lock into the active site on the enzyme. And then the enzyme does its thing. It clips off a maltose, boom. And, and and then you know back to and it just keeps going and going and going and it's unbelievably fast. So then the inhibitor where it comes in. So an inhibitor is a molecule that 
that gets into that active site and basically just just ties up the enzyme. And when it when it does it, and so there's a few different ways um, that it, that it can do that. One is to, it'll it'll like covalently bind permanently, like deactivate. It'll take that enzyme out of the picture. It's done. It's dead. Okay. Deactivated. And then there's also so-called reversible inhibition where a molecule has um, a very similar structure to the, the substrate for that enzyme and will just kind of sit down in that active site and just really just kind of occupy the site. It, it doesn't permanently deactivate the enzyme, but it's just sort of, you know, blocking the, the active site from, from that starch molecule to get in there and, and make more, more glucose. So that's, those are the sort of two basic um, sort of inhibitor type, you know, molecules that, you know, if you're thinking from a drug discovery perspective, if you're just really focused on the amylase enzyme and the structure of it and what's going on there. Well, yeah. And I guess we kind of would be right. If we're talking about the freshening power of, of hops, we're looking at, you know, this amylase enzyme or well, theoretically, right. This amylase enzyme that's on hops that's causing um, those dextrins to get further broken down. And then the yeast consume the yeast that's in solution, consume those sugars and byproducts or alcohol and, and, and CO2. So I think, so I, if I, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is, is there may be ways that we can control this process, right. Of, of the freshening power of hops by adding these, um, you know, inhibitors, assuming we can, you know, figure out what the inhibitors are, but we could add those and sort of control the process and manage uh, where and to what extent the freshening power of hops happens. Yeah. And I'm convinced we already do, or as an industry, because if you, you know, out in the world, you talk to people, you know, not everyone experiences hop creep. Uh-huh. And I just have a sense that there are certain raw materials or could be, I don't know, mashing parameters or types i don't know that that but 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 things that are currently in the um in the brewing sort of you know food chain that contain amylase inhibitors yeah and and therefore like that there are circumstances where people just don't get creep and it's not about the hops in that case it's because there's something in their wort or that you know the beer the amylase inhibitors specifically that are preventing this you know hop creep from from proceeding. I would recommend if anyone seriously wants to dig in, well, I'd like to be in touch with anyone who's like never experienced hop creep and, you know, in, in their dry hopping beers warm in the presence of yeast and do not ever experience hop creep, or if they've got a certain beer that never creeps or something like that, I would love to, to, you know, like dig in and, and, and help, um, you know, figure out, identify what, what are these molecules or, or proteins or, um, in the sources, but this would be, you know, yet another tool, right. In the arsenal of the, of the modern brewer to be able to like, you know, turn that on and off, right. But, you know, add an inhibitor to prevent the, the, the creep, or, you know, if you want freshening power to, um, you know, be sure that you're working with raw materials that are going to allow the freshening power to express itself. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, Wait, should, Kate, should... you know, um, I realize I need to backtrack or I think I, I said something misleading. Okay. I said that I'm, I'm convinced that there are amylase inhibitors in the sort of in the food chain, the brewing f- food chain, as it were. Now there's no question. There's no question that there are amylase inhibitors in the brewing food chain and in the brewing world. There are um, endogenous amylase inhibitors from barley and from wheat. There's a whole, you know, world of, of research um, that really picks up in the early 1980s. Um, and, you know, the, the, the questions that, that, that I have are, you know, how are they distributed in the current, you know, sort of malt system? Are they, or are these molecules, are they sort of mostly destroyed in malting? Um, does it vary? Do I, I, does it depend on the barley more than the malting process? I, I don't, you know, who knows? Or, well, I th- there's a lot known, I, I guess. There's a whole bunch. There's probably, you know, probably a thousand papers on this topic. Um, anyone in academia with access to those papers, please dig in and summarize them. That would be very <laughs> useful. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, cool. So you then decided, okay, we 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 know that these um, inhibitors, uh, you know, sort of exist, and that that provides a really fascinating uh, research opportunity for the future. But you know, without these inhibitors, the amylases are just chugging along, right? They're just chop chop chopping up these dextrins and then turning it into sugars, and so the yeast can can go along as long as there's sufficient, you know, amylase enzyme to do it. So you started thinking, hey, could we? do this? Could we add dry hops and carbonate beers? So let's talk about uh, your study. Let's talk about what you what you set up. So this study uh, you did back in 2018, I think. Is that right? I think the, the work was done in um, summer of 2017, but yeah, we, it, we it got published in 2018. Okay, cool. And and so let's t- talk real quick about your study. So how did you design the study to, to test whether you could carbonate with hops? Um. I don't think there there wasn't really a question if we could sort of, you know, backtrack a little bit, you know, and I'll point it right back again to the Brown and Morris work. Um, I think another epiphany that comes out of of reading that work um, for for, for me anyway, was, was um, you you always hear about the preservative qualities of hops, right? And it's always attributed to the antimicrobial activity of beta acids and other components, but specifically antimicrobial activity. That's what preservative properties of hops means. But then when you think of, you know, think of oxygen is terrible for beer, right? You know, keeping oxygen out of beer is a way to preserve beer. And if you're constantly producing CO2 and keeping positive pressure, you know, inside those wooden barrels on those boats to India, you're preserving the beer. You're, you're, you know, that's the most like basic antioxidant, you know, you're keep, literally keeping the oxygen out through positive pressure in, in those barrels. Anyway, so, so it was, you know, very inherent that, you know, carbonating beer was, you know, one of the reasons that you were adding hops to beer, um, you know, back then, you know, dry, dry hopping beer. I love it. Maybe so obvious that no one ever bothered to say it. Right. <laughs> Maybe they just it was so clear to them that that's what they were doing. They didn't ever actually write it down or or talk about it in that way. They did. It's written. I'm, I'm, no, it's it's out there somewhere. There, There's there's a book, there's a journal, there's you know, there, there's there's detailed information from centuries ago that will be enlightening and helpful to to us now because, you know, the time and you know sort of care that people had, you know, back then for their. Uh, it's, it's just a different world. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So I think I understand you there. So my, so when I asked the question to test whether you could carbonate with hops, your answer is, well, you can absolutely <laughs> carbonate with hops. Yeah, I'm not saying that's a dog or it was like, you know, inherently obvious t- to, to me. Sure. It's just like when you start sort of digging into this, whatever problem as it were of, of, you know, hop creep. Um, it sort of becomes obvious, right? You just know if, if you're getting alcohol, you know, I mean, there's other ways you could explain, you know, maybe getting getting alcohol. But, you know, if you're getting alcohol, you're getting CO2, you know, balling formula. And, you know, that's just how fermentation works. Yeah. Um, so it would be really strange if you weren't also getting CO2. And anyway, it's just like you read the Brown and Mars. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's inherent. But as far as, you know, designing the studies, I wouldn't say that the, you know, the study, I think that the, the study that a study, a quick and dirty experiment is what, what we'll talk about today. So the study that we're talking about today, you did sort of a, just a quick and dirty preliminary test, right? Yes. Um, and in, and in this one, you took essentially just three beers. Um, one was a normal beer. Um, and then you did two beers that were mixed, uh, with sour beer. So a normal beer mixed with sour beer. I think one was, uh, 33% normal and, uh, one was 67% normal. We're targeting basically yeah. 100% normal, two-thirds normal, one-third normal. There you go. Cool. And, and so first question then, or well, I guess we should go finish out what you did. So then you added dry hops to each of those bottles. Um, at what rate? What rate did you use? Targeted two pounds per barrel. Okay. All right. So how many hops was that in in a you know half liter or well, I guess it was a one liter plastic bottles, but you essentially used like a half liter of, of beer. Exactly. And you need to leave, if you're doing these sort of experiments, you need to leave yourself a lot of headspace because when you go to add the hops, um, you get a, just a lot of foaming. Oh, and yeah. 
what's, you know, I think, you know, very important for these studies is to not lose any mass and to sort of make sure that the amount of hops that you weighed and that you're accounting for as the cause of the effects that you're observing that you don't lose. Cause if, if you try and add a, you know, a pellet of hops to a beer bottle, that's mostly full of beer, it's going to foam all the way over. You're going to lose a bunch of hops mm -hmm. and um, lose a bunch of mass, gas, everything. So you need to leave yourself plenty of headspace. Yeah. Yep. And then, and basically we're, you know, in, that's like basically one pellet of, of hops. We okay. work with, with pellets. Um, yeah. One pellet. I see from your notes is around, you know, 4.7 or 4.9 around, you know, five grams of hops basically. Yeah. One, one pellet ish, of hops. Roughly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, ish. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, uh, so then I have a question real quick. Or let me ask you two questions, um, and then and then we'll uh, jump to a break and, and get into the results. Uh, so the first question was, why the difference? Why why sour beers? Um, why'd, you, why'd you mix the normal beers with the sour beers? Again, it's just super quick and dirty. Um, you know, e e enzyme activity is, you know, two of the, you know, primary sort of drivers of enzyme activity are temperature and pH. Ah, yeah, okay. Right. So, so, you know, changes in pH tend to change the, the conformation, the three-dimensional structure of molecules in, in, in general, but proteins and enzymes, very specific. Anyway, um, just to kind of explore and, and just to get a sense, are, are we going to see any super dramatic differences over the range of, basically, this is a pH range of maybe 3.9 to 4.5, okay. which I, I felt sort of covers the... The, the general sort of, you know, range of you know, normal beers for the most part. Yeah. And it was just kind of looking for any, like anything super interesting, you know, in terms of like, Oh, you know, zero activity in the, you know, whatever one or the other, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. More activity. Basically just to kind of feel out um, whether it would be worth doing a more comprehensive um, study of the pH impact, you know, on this phenomenon. Yeah, on on that. Okay, good. And then uh, the, the other question I had was, uh, was there anything else? Were there any other controls um, for this experiment that you think are worth uh, mentioning if anybody's going to repeat this experiment? Uh, the, f the first thing, you know, absolutely don't blow anything up. You say, <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I, I'm convinced the reason that it was banned in Germany is because people were overpressurizing, you know, vessels and, and it can be Yeast are very powerful. I mean, the amount of pressure that they can produce before they, you know, die essentially is enormous. Um, you yeah. can create very dangerous amounts of pressure um, doing this sort of work in enclosed containers. So I'd say, you know, first and foremost, make sure you have a pressure gauge or some way to, you know, continuously monitor your CO2, your, your, your pressure in, inside of your vessel, you know, up and until the point where you're so on top of this and you know exactly what's going to happen that, um, that it would be okay to do again, you know, in a closed container without constant monitoring. Okay. Um, yeah. And another thing of course, is to, you know, be, be, be sanitary. If you're having people taste any of these things and that's why the, the, the plastic bottle format in here is we wanted to use um, food grade containers. So we got, you know, brand new um, soda water um, containers and sanitize them with iota four immediately before use. And, and basically just did everything. Um, you know, outside of, in a in food production area, like not in a you know laboratory um, type. If people are going to be tasting, but obviously that goes without saying. Yeah, yeah. hopefully we're going to taste it, right? <laughs> yes. Um, well, and in fact, you did taste it, but not only that, you uh, you measured the CO two uh, over time. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to discuss uh, how much and if we were able to carbonate the beers uh, in this experiment, and then what they tasted like. Dr. Luke Chadwick did a quick and dirty study to measure how dry hops might uh, carbonate beer. And he's back with us to discuss his results. So let's do a quick recap. So we were, uh, you did three beers, right? You did a regular beer and then you did two mixes with sour beer, one that was two thirds regular or normal and then one third normal. Uh, and then you added a pellet <laughs> or about five grams of hops to a half liter of beer. Uh, and you wanted to look and see, did it work? Did we carbonate it? And how high did we get that carbonation? So let's look at those results. First of all, I wanted to just sort of see what, um, what measurements did you take in this? I'm assuming at least an initial, um, and a, and a, and a end on the CO2 levels. 
Yeah, actually, I measured CO2 every day from the beginning using, again, that, that non-destructive um, uh, CO2 testing device, that CO2 selector. Um, so I actually got readings every day over the course of five days. Um, but I think what's, re- I'll just mention the, the starting CO2 and the final CO2 and the sure. you know, pretty predictable curve between the two. So um, basically they all start out at one, pretty much exactly one CO2 volume, which is kind of typical of N fermented beer. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> The final CO2 volumes after five days were um, basically 2.2, 2.4, and 2.2 wow. volumes of, of CO2, which is totally, totally, you know, that's carbonated. It's maybe on the low side for, for a couple of them. Um, but again, this was just quick and dirty. The idea is that this would be a sort of a preliminary step towards, um, so you know, Firkin, are you familiar with Firkins? Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're convinced, you know, I, I think we know for, for sure people have been dry hopping Firkins for throughout the entire craft res- renaissance and stories, you know, foamy kegs. And, and, and so, so that, you know, the idea is to intentionally carbonate beer with hops in the context of a Firkin. And so the goal here was to just kind of, you know, again, sort of the overarching goal of like you know, getting on top of this thing, getting away from hop creep you know, moving towards freshening power. Right. And, but it's, it's hard. It, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, you know, especially if you're worried about, you know, over pressurizing, you know, safety hazards and stuff like that, we want to you know, do it right. We don't want to lose any momentum or steam or hurt someone. Cause that would kill any, any momentum, you know, and using this, you know, positively, but the, you know, the goal would be of like to, to, to get your knowledge up to the point where you could be like really confident that, Okay, on you know today on Monday, I'm gonna fill this firkin with with beer. I'm gonna add you know exactly this much hops. I'm gonna close that firkin, and you know this Friday that beer is gonna be ready to serve. And you know and, and to be like totally confident, we don't need to test it, we don't need to evaluate. You know to 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 just you know have that sort of level of sort of understanding and confidence that we know what the hell is going on with with this. So that's what was this was you know going to be maybe a preliminary towards towards something like that just to kind of see you know after five days where is it does pH make much of a difference and so I guess pH didn't really make all that much of a difference just can't say there, so there were no you know for for me if there's not you know replicates oh, um, sure. there's you you can't say I'd say two point so the actual readings were two point one nine two point three six two point one nine okay. As far as I'm concerned, those are identical. Like there's, you know, until I get, you know, triplicates at least of, you know, each of these, um, I, I can't say if they're any different. They're all in the ballpark of exactly where we're trying to go is the carbonated beer. They all carved up. Okay. Yeah. So they all carved up. I mean, that's the takeaway, right? So, so this is the, this is proof. Um, well, not like we needed proof, but it, but it's a measure, right? That we actually got to a level of carbonation, uh, that's reasonable. And, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, you brought up the, the Firkins. Um, yeah. I mean, the whole real ale, uh, you know, movement, uh, in the UK, uh, about, you know, refermentation, uh, inside the barrel, inside the Firkin, uh, and and sort of the low carbonation, well, low to I guess American standards, uh, you know that that you're getting that two two or especially two four is plenty of carbonation uh, in that type of style, right? I would think so, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you could you could get it up more. We've done this, you know, enough times. You could add more hops, and those numbers go up. Uh, yeah, sure, exactly, right. You add more hop. That's uh, that's I think the result of what Jake's was saying. You know, I mean, at you know. The more hops you add in there, the more amylase enzyme, um, uh, or let's call it hop diastase. There we go, uh, is is available, and, and the higher conversion you have. Um, all right. Well, did you? So I, you, I'm, I'm sure you tasted these beers. Yes. <laughs> what they taste like? Yes. Well, first of all, I have to say that the the foam quality was spectacular. Just <laughs> the, the sort of the carbonation was to me just like really special, just like really just beautiful sort of tight little you know just creamy foam oh yeah uh, you know whether that has anything to do with the carbonation method i you know i i i, I doubt it it's probably just you know excellent beer to begin with or whatever um <laughs> maybe i mean who knows it could you've added some hop components to it we know that hops have foam positive you know yeah. particles and so 
yeah, maybe it is. Maybe the the quality of foam could also improve. Something to look at in the future, at least. So yeah, but anyway, that was the the first thing I noticed. This was you know I like set this up. We had you know a bunch of you know really important people at, at, at Bell's were you know in the room, and I was like you know trying to build the case. Like let's let's you know build this you know brand or or explore this more, and um, you know I guess you know be the first to market in the modern era with. You know, I, the term, uh, you know, old English, uh, uh, new old England IPA was, was the, <laughs> there you was, go. Was, yeah. Was, was the pitch. Um, so anyway, okay. So, so, you know, poured, you know, again, we had like 500 mils of, of, of beer and like, you know, 10 people. And so everyone basically got a, a taste, beautiful foam, but they were all loaded with diacetyl. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. That's, that, that's a that's a big problem. That's a a no go at Bell's, that's for sure. Um but I continued to make the pitch and oh well, in, in old England, that was that's how it was. And just we just we can say that and but no, that's <laughs> we, we can't. It, so no. why do you uh why do you think uh the beers had so much um uh, or diacetyl? Um Fundamentally, I, I think it's it's because you know, the secondary fermenta- fermentation that was initiated through you know adding hops and enzymes, breaking down sugars and the yeast, do what yeast do, um, continue continue to metabolize um, those sugars and just they make diacetyl or acetolactic acid. They're making valine, whatever they're making their amino acids. Um, as per usual, this is not uncommon at all with dry hop beers to see a, a, a spike in, in diacetyl, um, you know, after dry hopping. The question that, you know, the big question that I have is, can you just give it more time and the diacetyl will go down? Will the yeast reduce the diacetyl? Um, I don't know. It seems like it's going to be a challenge. Um, I've been you know, researching this some and I've come to learn that CO2 is toxic to yeast toxic oh, yeah. otherwise or otherwise it's like it's massively impactful to just all kinds of regulation of you know yeast metabolism it's different from just pressure like if you just pressurize a vessel that has you know there's a hydrostatic sort of impact on yeast but it's amazing what yeast can handle in terms of, of pressure but co2 is it's there's something other than just the pressure the co2 pressure that is impacting the yeast it's the actual you know molecule co2 has a sort of some kind of regulatory feedback super impactful to yeast metabolism let's just say it like co2 concentration is incredibly impactful to yeast metabolism and it would make a lot of sense that it's going to be hard to reduce diacetyl in a beer that's two and a half co2 volumes (laughs) it's almost like a catch 22 then what you decarbonate it to let the diacetyl reduce and then you then start over again <laughs> <laughs> right all right that kind of defeats the point right if you're trying to carbonate with this yeah so it seems like the options are you just go with it and like convince people that diacetyl is okay <laughs> um, another option is to try and target you know, use yeasts that don't make so much diacetyl or you know there's a lot of strains out there that well certainly that tend to make less diacetyl than the particular strain that that i was working with which tends to make a lot of diacetyl uh huh. Uh huh. Well, that's an interesting topic, right there, right? So, so you know, I mean, okay, we've got these diacetyl bombs, but and you've sort of raised, I asked the question, well, maybe just time, maybe the yeast itself might take up a little bit of that diacetyl, but the CO two toxicity is probably going to be an issue. Well, what if we just changed the yeast itself and used a lesser, um, you know, like you said, a lesser diacetyl producing yeast, you know, uh, something that doesn't produce that as much. That may be something that that brewers uh, brewers could use. But you also touched on something that I think is interesting as well, which is convincing people that diacetyl, you know, isn't a bad thing. Um, maybe not to go that far, but but I know that. But there are certain styles that diacetyl is OK, right? Like yeah. I think of uh, I think of a real ale, you know, English hoppy IPA and I'm OK with diacetyl in that beer. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just it, it, diacetyl is a very interesting thing. Just that sort of the to you know most normal you know people that aren't you know in the, in the beer world like don't have any problems with it. It's pleasant. It's a pleasant smelling, pleasant flavor for for them. It's added as a flavoring agent to lots of things <laughs> because <Yeah>. normal people <laughs> <laughs> tend to find it somewhat pleasant in general. 
Um, but yeah, it's just a no go in, in brewing. And I think one of the, I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. And I think one of the, one of them is that it's hard to stabilize. Like if you try and build a brand around that flavor mm. and keep the diacetyl at those concentrations for six months in package, good luck. It's, it's very reactive. It's, it's not a stable compound. So I, I think that's, that's a really good reason not to, not to go there is like, you know, good luck stabilizing it through, you know, shelf life of a normal beer um, and have that prominent diacetyl note prominent, you know, th- throughout that, you know, th- the entire time. Um, sure, sure. Sounds like a really interesting challenge. Well, yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering too, now, as I think about this uh, a little bit more, it, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, there's a reason why English IPAs can, uh, or, you know, uh, traditionally maybe, or, or let me, let me back that up. Maybe there is a reason why, or maybe we now have additional information as to why English IPAs sometimes have that diacetyl character uh, to them. And, and yeah. so, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of like Cascales, uh, you know, a lot of people like to drink cask ales. I don't know how popular they are here, you know, in the United States. I know if I see an ale on cask, I'm definitely going to try it um, at the brewery because it's usually unique and usually they're pretty good. That's an opportunity, isn't it? You know, to 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 use dry hops in casks um, to make, you know, English style beers. Absolutely. I think that could be a cool opportunity for research, too, because I think, you know, fundamentally, this is very similar to the problem of bottle conditioning. Mm. where you know but there you're you know sort of adding all the sugar at time zero as opposed to what we're talking about you'd be trickle feeding that sugar over days and whether like i I don't know i I don't have enough experience with with bottle conditioning to to know but i i imagine that there's diacetyl problems sometimes (laughs) and and that basically there's probably some knowledge there that's relevant to this Oh yeah, a good idea, right? Read up on, um, like you said, you know, certain strains producing diacetyl. Maybe there are some diacetyl issues in bottle conditioning in beers that are refermented. Like, surely we've we've come up with this this issue, right? And and there's plenty of beers that are secondary fermented in the bottle that are bottle conditioned that taste fine that don't have diacetyl. Exactly. It's 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 do it's doable. There's a way. There's, yeah. There's, there's no doubt about that. Oh, fascinating. So, uh, so we also talked, I mean, we spent a good deal of time in the first segment talking about amylase, you know, inhibitors, you know, I guess if we are going to inhibit, uh, amylase are, we're not talking about stopping it entirely, right? We're maybe like controlling the process. Like if you could, you know, use a certain type of malt or something earlier in the process, maybe you could, um, like you said, control the amount of carbonation and the amount of refermentation that happens in the bottle. So you don't have to worry about, you know, six months down the road, bottles and cans exploding. Is that an option? I'd say in the future, I think is, is the key word. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's a, it's all about knowledge. You, you know, if, if you had total knowledge, you know, right now of all the amylase inhibitors and all your brewing materials, you'd be, you know, a thousand percent ahead of, of the game. No one knows about what amylase inhibitors are in their malts, in their hops, and any of the other all kinds of new, you know, things that are being added to beers. You, you know, you know, now it's it's um there's just a lot of very knowable unknowns in, in this <laughs> in this in this realm. And I'd like to think that yeah in the future a lot of this stuff will be sorted out. I'm not sure that it'll be like sort of COA type material i think it'll be more like it'll just be sort of a known property it'll be something that is somewhat you know standardized at at the, at the raw material level mm-hmm. to, some, to some degree and it'll just be somewhat you know known like this hop or whatever this malt has a lot of inhibitors and if you're you know when you add that you're not going to get much creep no matter what hops you're dry hopping with you're not going to get much creep because there's all these amylase inhibitors and these you know other materials that you're working with uh-huh. so again i think it's it's just a matter of of knowledge and, you know, setting up those future brewers to, to use the tools and, you know, levers and knobs that. Well, yeah. And I, and I think about this, you know, if I could add a, you know, a pellet of hops, I mean, in a, you know, in a, in a, or probably less than a pellet of hops, a half or a quarter pellet of hops in like a 12 ounce bottle or a 12 ounce can or something, and then just seal those up and get my own refermentation and it turns out good, right? Like not a diacetyl bomb with a different yeast strain or maybe, uh, marketing it to style, there's really a lot of opportunity 
um, uh, for doing this. I mean, there's certainly, a, you know, a lot of challenges <laughs> associated with that as well, right? Mm-hmm. If you, especially from a commercial brewery, I can't imagine like, you know, um, a, a, a commercial brewery that's packaging bottles and cans uh, that it would be very easy or effective to drop, um, you know, some uh, some hops um, into into those cans in a sanitary way. Uh, but, you know, maybe. <laughs> like I can't. I don't think you would. You wouldn't want, you need to remove the hops after. Yeah. After a you certain know, time, you don't want them sitting for months and then the shelf. No, yeah. no, I, I really, I mean, to that point, I think this is, this is something for like, you know, home brewers and really small, you know, brew, brew pubs, like nano brew type operations um, to, to really, I think like take full advantage of like, even, you know, given all that knowledge, you know, that, that potential knowledge of you know every animalase inhibitor and, you know, total knowledge of our raw materials, it's still kind of impractical, you know, at the scale that, you know, bells and many of the sort of larger craft breweries are at to, you know, to do anything with it. It's just, um, it's just an engineering nightmare. <laughs> if you think you'd have to sort of redesign so much of the, you know, the entire process to, to, you know, to take advantage of, you know, to, to carbonate beer, you know, at, at our scale this way, but, but at a, you know, you know nano brew at a, at a brew pub on the home brew scale, be careful. I have to say, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's why I'm like, apprehensive to you know encourage people to 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 do this do these sort of studies sure sure Um, sure yeah yeah and absolutely everybody please be safe i mean you are talking about additional pressure in a vessel and you're talking about closing that vessel so please please do be safe um you know take it seriously test it out in in plastic bottles maybe first uh before going into glass bottles and you know trying to carbonate up to three volumes or four volumes or any of that mess you know please take it please take it seriously and please be careful uh doing it so all right i asked this um i asked this question sort of towards the end of every show because i think it's really fascinating um if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, we talked about a lot. Uh, what would that thing be? I th- okay, so I, I think enzyme activity and enzyme inhibition. That those two things, and and I, I would encourage someone to look at. Um, I'm sorry, this is maybe a bit more into the weeds than you were hoping we would go, but to to look at um, diabetes research. And specifically, the hunt for amylase inhibitors in the context of treatments for diabetes. And you see, you know, a majority of like the developing world, right? Most of the people in the world use plants as part of their primary health care. And there's currently right now in 2021, people actively studying all of their traditional medicines, all of their plants, all their food crops, hunting for amylase inhibitors as potential treatments for diabetes. And that as just one sort of way to kind of like like sort of like dig in and sort of, you know, develop um, um, whatever I can, some models in your head about, you know, you know, kind of, we, we know enzymes make beer, right? Yeast make enzymes and, and, and they, you know, do all this sort of heavy lifting as far as, you know, the, you know, make, making alcohol CO2 um, enzymes are the heavy hitters. Um, I guess. So I, what I wanted to sort of get into is, you know, we've only really been talking about, you know, hops and, and, you know, barley, in grains and, and so on but you know beer is so much more you know diverse now than it's, than it's ever been and we are so far from being limited to those you know four raw materials um you know fruit beers are a you know a big thing fruits are loaded with enzymes and enzy- enzyme activities and enzyme inhibitors and to to just like really be um my, I guess mindful, I guess that's my advice to like, to, to, you know, brace yourself or, uh, you know, as it were, just like, know that enzyme activity is real and powerful as are inhibitors of that enzyme activity. And things like that could be like the, you know, I don't want to say simple, but like the, the root, the cause of things that, you know, from a traditional brewing mindset might not even be on the radar, you, you know, basically that, you know, you're, you could be, you know, adding a fruit that is, you know, has enzymes and that's doing all this stuff that's in your mind, you're just adding it for sugar or flavor. You're not even thinking that there's all these, you know, sort of bioactive molecules, you know, in there. And I guess that would be the, the lesson, you know, plants are, yeah. you know, have a lot of tricks up their sleeves and um, we need to really be, you know, 
pay close attention to what they're doing to our beers. Be mindful of the enzymes uh, that are that are in the ingredients that you're adding, like hops. Right. Be be mindful of hop the hop diastase um, and and what it can do. Well, uh, this has been a, a, a fantastically interesting show. Is there anything else you want to talk about the freshening power of hops or carbonating with hops that we didn't get to talk about today? Oh, so much. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation, and uh, listeners, this uh, study obviously wasn't uh, wasn't published, uh, so there won't be a link to a study. But we will put uh, the links to the papers that we talked about uh, in the show, so you can read more about hop diastase, freshening power of hops, and amylase inhibitors. Uh, so, thanks, uh, Dr. Luke Chadwick. Thank you for coming in the Brew Lab today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Kate. I just wanted to thank you for, for, for doing that. Cool. No, yeah, I appreciate it. All right, listeners, please be sure to check out the Brewlosophy podcast. Uh, you can find that on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out the experiments and all of the other fun things we're up to over at Brewlosophy.com. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.